being baptized in 55 degree water brings a whole new meaning to being born again. Uh, you come out of that water feeling like a new person. Amen. And it was freezing last year. Was it September? That was two years ago. Two years ago. Um, yeah, so maybe this little pool, which is kind of cool because it's like eight feet long by four feet and it's only, you know, but if anyone's getting baptized, that ought to be up in time for it to heat up just a little bit. Yeah. And that would be kind of cool. So I just want to clarify. <laughs> I just want to clarify the announcements. Did I hear right that we're eating next week? Yes. And then we're selling food in the park or yes. tickets. And then we're eating again. On the 15th. We like to eat here. <laughs> I, just, I just want to clarify. This church likes to eat. <laughs> Uh, amen. I like to eat spiritually. I like to eat physically. And I want you to know, like, this, this area of chairs um, is awkward. I know. It's just weird in the church here because it's like the island that nobody wants to sit at because you feel like you're sort of in the, on the, in the spotlight or something. So Toby has been helping me with the words, and so I came down, and I, I didn't want to get in front of everybody. And then I was kind of in the middle, and then I went over by Cherry and Sunny, and then I'm like, well, I'll scoot up here. But I want you to know something. This is anointed right here. So if you, <laughs> if you need a, a breakthrough someday and you're in this house, you might just have to come up in between these chairs and, and really tap into that, that breaking anointing. Amen? So I got that today. I, I'm sorry about you all, but um, I, I took it and uh, I'm happy. Amen. Father, we praise you. We thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you are here. Holy Spirit, we pray you minister to every one of us. I thank you, Lord, that you know how to reach every one of us right where we need it. I pray that today, God, as you spread out a buffet, Lord, that we would all just partake of what we need today. And Lord, that we would leave here feeling satisfied and filled. And so, Lord, we praise you and we thank you that you are here with us and that you love us so dearly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you were here last night, I think I... I've preached a mini 10-minute message of today's message, so if you hear it again. Um, I went home and looked at my notes, and I thought, wow, I like hit every note, like everything in 10 minutes, and I thought, that's terrible, because now the whole thing is going to be repeated if you were here last night. But somehow I did it all in 10 minutes, so it could be a fast message, but that never happens. So <laughs> we'll just go with it and see, what, see where we go. I, I, I toyed around with the idea of using a different story out of Daniel, but I really like the story of Jesus walking on the water, and I, I want to do that one again, and I'm sure for those of you that weren't here, you'll be delighted to hear it. Amen? I want to start out with a, a devotional that was last week, and I just printed it off here, and I just, I just want to read this, and somehow the Lord is going to fit this into the message. I'm not sure how. I don't have the title, but I'm just going to read it. If you were here Wednesday, I think I read it Wednesday. So if you were here Wednesday or last night, you've got this whole thing. You can go if you have to. I mean, <laughs> Jesus did not say to make converts to the way or to your way of thinking, but he said to look after his sheep, to see that they get nourished in the knowledge of him. We consider what we do in the way of Christian work as service, yet Jesus Christ calls service to be what we are to him, not what we do for him. Discipleship is based solely on devotion to Jesus Christ, not on following after a particular belief or doctrine. If anyone comes to me and does not hate, he cannot be my disciple, Luke 14, 26. In this verse, there is no argument and no pressure from Jesus to follow him. He is simply saying, in effect, if you want to be my disciple, you must be devoted, devoted solely to me. A person touched by the Spirit of God suddenly says, Now I see who Jesus is, and that is the source of devotion. Or a person who's been baptized at our house in 55 degree water comes out saying, Now I know. No, but I, I thought this devotion was amazing because we have a tendency to get caught up with the idea of serving God, and we get hung up on the service that we do un, you know, for Him and we, not the service unto him, our devotion to Christ. And as it reads on, it says, Today we have substituted doctrinal belief for personal belief. And that is why so many people are devoted to causes and so few are devoted to Jesus Christ. People do not really want to be devoted to Jesus, but only to the cause he started. 
Jesus Christ is deeply offensive to the educated minds of today, to those who only want him to be their friend or who are unwilling to accept him in any other way. Our Lord's primary obedience was to the will of his Father, not to the needs of people. Try to swallow that one, guys. Jesus did not come for the needs of the people. He came to obey his Father, to do his Father's will. The saving of people was the natural outcome of his obedience to the Father. If I am devoted solely to the cause of humanity, I will soon be exhausted and come to a point where my love will waver and stumble. But if I love Jesus Christ personally and passionately, I can serve humanity even though people may treat me like a doormat. Amen. The secret of a disciple's life is devotion to Jesus Christ. And the characteristic of that life is its seeming insignificance and its meekness. Yet it is like a grain of wheat that falls to the ground and dies and it will spring up and change the entire landscape. Isn't that amazing? That's powerful. I think of the YMCA, and I mentioned this Wednesday, but I think of the YMCA started out as a very thriving organization. It started out as a prayer meeting. It started out with 12 men in an upper room, praying for their coworkers. People were coming to the Lord, and then they would lead them to the Lord, get saved, and then they would bring them into their group, and the group began to grow. And within like five to seven years, this thing expanded all over Europe and then made its way to America. And there's like over, I mean, there's thousands of YMCAs today. But YMCA today is primarily, if we think about it, it's a swimming gym. It's a, it was a missional organization who was on point, who loved Jesus Christ, and who <coughs> sat at Jesus' feet serving, and they were devoted unto Christ for the cause of the kingdom. I can show you letters and stuff that people from the YMCA wrote in 1891 to the leaders of today. And they were warning them, to not stray from the mission, to not stray from the devotion, it actually says that, to Christ. Otherwise, we'll just become a building with able secretaries and a pool and a you know, basketball court and the whole nine yards. And I think about it today, and, and we have like our, our mission, and, and you know, it's, it's to build the spirit, mind, and body of all people in an atmosphere of Christian fellowship. What does that even mean? Do you hear that? That mission statement alone says what that devotion was talking about. They're obsessed with and, and they love the, I, the idea of the cause. Our core values are caring, respect, responsibility, right? These are the, these are the, what the, this is the, the fruit or the attributes of Jesus Christ, but they're not in love anymore with Jesus. So they've become a movement, I guess if you will. Some might say they've become a monument. They used to be a missional movement, but now it's just become a building, a structure, something kind of lifeless. Every year, the YMCA CEOs, write, they have to sign a form, and they have to send it off to the national YMCA. And on the first line, it says, I swear allegiance to Jesus Christ. And then it gets shoved in a box. So the leaders of the YMCA, they had it right. They had understanding of what why they were doing it but over time and i mean this is a long time 1850s to you know not 2017 they have drifted mission drifted into just being an organization that's obsessed with or caught up with the idealism or the the movement rather than the mover and in our lives today you know i, I want I, I guess the question i want to ask us this morning as i stir us up here as we look at some verses is what is our means of transportation this morning? What is your means of transportation into the spirit realm or into heaven? Or, you know, we all know Jesus is the way, right? The truth and the life. But there's only one train that's got, you know, heaven bound. Next stop, heaven. There's only one going there. Uh, I sat and met this lady the other day. I was putting in an application for a, a chaplain's position at the um, a veteran's home. And it's a per diem thing. Like it's, it's three hours a week, and they pay like 35 bucks an hour, but it's three hours a week, and you go up and you do church service and stuff, and I thought, that'd be kind of cool. And I got talking to this lady, and she's like asking me questions. Are you a universalist? You know, and so in our conversation, it turns out she's in the yoga. Okay. Um, but she says, America has bastardized, if that's the right word, yoga, because I do the stuff that's Hinduism and, you know, the original, like what it was all about, the spiritual stuff, the the bad stuff. And then she goes on to say, I used to be a Methodist. I used to be this part of this denomination. And she has slipped away from being a Christian to believing now that Jesus is just one way or one road. 
And she sat right across me and said, wanted to know what I believed. And I'm like, well, hell. <laughs> you know, they get in a room with a, a person like this. And you don't want to be offensive. And, you know, poss- I could possibly be applying to get this position to be a believer of Christ, a minister to these folks. And she knows that. But you don't want to totally like, well, <laughs> lady, you're off. You know, <laughs> you don't want to totally burn your bridge before you even build it. But she's off. There's one way. We know this. But as we look today at some verses, I just want you to be thinking about that. Is, can, can we slip? Is it possible that we can drift a little to getting caught up in things in life and just the, the everyday things that we're doing? And can that take us away from our foundation or our means of transportation or our foundation or our boat? In this case, we're going to look at the disciples out on the water. Amen? Amen? So if you turn with me to Matthew 14... New Testament, first book, first gospel, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. And we're going to pick up in a story where Jesus had just fed 5,000 people. Great signs and wonders were being performed at the hands of Christ as he walked in, in, in his earthly ministry. And 5,000 souls were fed. And Jesus, it says in verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up to the mountains by himself to pray. He went up to the mountains by himself to be centered. I mean, think about this. It's so, it's so important, some of the little verses, some of the little things that we can read right past. But he just got done with a huge meeting. He just got done with this great crowd of, of people who he fed and miracles were done. And he dismisses them and sends them on his way. And a lot of us would go out to Denny's to celebrate. You know, a lot of us would take the time to pat each other on the back and say, wow, what an amazing service we just had. But Christ sends them away, sends his disciples out onto the water, and it says he goes up into the mountainside by himself to recalibrate. Probably, maybe, he went up there to say, Father, are you pleased? See, because Jesus understood that his service was unto the Father. That was his will, was to do his will. If he was caught up on pleasing man, then he would have had a celebratory meeting. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now when evening came, verse 23, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. You guys love how, how the Gospels and how the Bible just tells stories as though this is just everyday normal stuff like Jesus went to them just walking on the sea, and then it goes right into something else. So Jesus went out walking them on the sea, and when his disciples saw them, verse 26, saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous and he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. We are living in a time like no other a time when the world is really watching you and I. And they're watching to see if what we have is genuine, real. The other story that I was toying around with with reading was Daniel 3, and it's Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and Daniel. And they were living in an extraordinary time in Babylon when all of Babylon, even the king, Nebuchadnezzar, was watching their lives. And if you really look at our culture and our society, we're living in a 
kind of a Babylonian society. We're living in a time when lawlessness is prevailing, when sin is prevailing. We call good bad and bad good. There's a lot of like corruption and just decay and things happening. And more than ever, the Lord is challenging us and relying on us. He's depending on us to be servants that would serve at his feet. See, we, we get caught up in, in this culture. And I mean, in the, I, love, I love all the, you know, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Like we just bought a video wall. And some people would say, what? Why? Well, I've always wanted one. That's why. <laughs> Do you know what a video wall is? At the big screen at the tabernacle last year that was on the stage, that's an LED video wall. You can't see a projection screen outside because of daylight. So they have to use an LED video wall. A lot of the large churches have those um, in their churches, and they can do all kinds of graphic stuff, put scriptures up, and do all kinds of things. Like when you see, like at a big church, you watch their videos, and it always seems like their stage changes and their set changes. A lot of times they're just changing pictures on the video wall. And so it changes the atmosphere of the, of the room. So I, I started looking the other day. I just bunny trailed at a story. And I thought, you know, a lot of even concerts, they don't use lights anymore. They just use video walls to project stuff. You can project videos, pictures, colors, graphics, all kinds of things. So I always wanted like, to get some. You can break them up. You can make a row of three, a row of three, a row of three, and then they can do interchange. You can do whatever you want. You, they, they come together. They undo. So it's not like one piece. They snap together. So I went on eBay, and I was looking, and I seen one for 7500 bucks. Well, just to give you an idea, this is 30 panels. They're $900 a piece. So a $25,000 video wall. And, you know, Michelle, Pastor Michelle is very um, <laughs> careful. I don't know, for lack of better words, very watches the books, watches things, and, and, and usually, you know, if it doesn't add up, it doesn't make sense. She's very reserved. And sometimes I <laughs> jump, and she looks at me and she says, well, why don't you ask them for it for free? And I'm like, you're out of your mind, girl. <laughs> why don't you ask them for it for free? Okay, you know, and she only does that once in a while. Like usually when, and then I always think she's, that's how we got in here. Let's go ask the landlord to rent us this place for 500 bucks a month. <coughs> they were getting two grand. Here we are. Because she said, why don't we go ask? And I'm like, you're, I were driving there and I'm like, I don't know why we're going here. He's not going to do it. <laughs> I've, I think I'm a faith guy. I do. Until I get challenged. So I send this thing off to this guy, right? Hey, you think about donating it, and I kind of make this long little letter. And I get this message back that says, let me check with my partner and my CPA, and I'll get back to you. Well, I, in there I said, we do have some cash, but not a lot. We need quite a bit of discount to make this thing work. Long story short, these people are in Las Vegas. They have a production company, and they bought this wall back in November for one gig. They used it twice, and they don't know how to use it because they're lighting guys and he said in order to compete with the las vegas big companies he says we can't even take the time to rent it so i'm a big firm believer in paying it forward so they didn't offer it to us for free but they said 3500 bucks so we're renting the wall for the tabernacle for 4100 dollars. two plus two so we bought it instead and we're going to use it it pays for itself and then it's going to be in our church. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen, right? To give you an idea, like, and you can make different sizes, so like from the end of this window to the end of that window, six feet high would be, if assembled in a rectangular shape, would be that. So it's pretty big. Now, you know, we'll still have our screens and our lights, and we're going to have all the bling and Batavia that anyone could ever want. <laughs> and then we're going to season it with Jesus, because without Jesus, it's just a bunch of lights. Amen. Amen. Amen? Why did I even go there? I have no idea. So let's try to go back here. <laughs> because God. Serving Him. He, he delights in the things that you delight in. And if your heart is right with Him, He wants us to have the desires of our heart. Especially if it's to serve Him. Jesus walks out on the water. Back to the story. And there's a few points that I want to make that kind of fascinate me about this story. Is One, Jesus goes and he spends some time with his father and he prays. And it says that 
the winds were boisterous and the waves were blowing and it said the boat was being tossed. And Jesus walks out on the water to the disciples in the boat. Why didn't he calm the water first? After Peter stepped out of the boat and they stepped back into the boat, it says then the wind stopped. And I know, in my opinion, that he didn't calm the, the waves first. He could have. Because Jesus is not interested in being a fix-it God. He's not interested in just solving all of your problems. Jesus wants to develop us and disciple us and to teach us to be overcomers like he is. He walks out on the water and the winds are blowing and the waves are tossing the boat all over the place. And Peter's like, if that's you, Lord, call to me and I'll come to you. And he's like, come. And right in the midst of the storm, in the midst of all the wind and the waves crashing into the boat, think about it. Peter steps out in faith. I mean, he's out in waves now. And he steps out into this and he meets Christ right in the middle of the storm. And I'm telling you that Jesus never promised you a perfect life. He never promised you a rose garden. He never promised. In fact, he said, in this world you will have trials, but to be of good cheer, for I am an overcomer, and I'm going to teach you how to be an overcomer in Christ. In fact, if you claim the name of Jesus and he is your Lord, that means that you are literally declaring to the world that I'm an overcomer in training. You are an overcomer in training because we have to overcome this place in Christ to get on that train that has one stop and that's the heavens. To make it to the Father. But Jesus is not interested in just answering your cries. Has anybody ever been, I, I've done it, like all hell breaks loose in my life and I find myself whining, complaining, oh Lord, please fix this. Do we not pray that like all the time? Lord, please fix. Lord, please fix. Lord, please fix. Lord, please fix, please deliver, please help, please deliver, please help. Lord, help me out of this mess. Lord, help me out. And you know what? And then we get upset with God when he doesn't help us out of our mess. Have you guys ever stopped to think even for a moment that he's not going to just help you out? That maybe he's calling you out into your mess because he's standing in the middle of your mess. And what is the means of your transportation, I asked you? What is the thing that, that, that we're riding in? What, are, what is it that we're a part of? What's, what are we traveling in to, to get to that place? Is it Christ? Are we centered? Are we in him? Or we, have we allowed our means of transportation to distract us? You know, when the disciples were in that boat, that was probably a little scary because the wind and the waves were tossing that boat around. Now, Peter being on the water probably didn't even observe the wind and waves because he's literally standing on water with the Lord. But being in the boat is where the wind and the waves were going to hurt you more. Anybody ever been in the boat where the, my daughter was and it threw her whole back out? We hit a wave, went up, came down, it threw her back. I've been tossed around in a boat. It's pretty small waves. Boats can be pretty reckless. And here they found themselves in this boat. They've probably taken on water, so they, they're chucking out the water. They're trying to get that out of the boat. And you know what happened? All their focus was on their safety place. What was keeping them afloat? Their means of transportation. Before they knew it, they were like, we got to get the water out. Hey, John, keep rowing. No, we got to get, get to the shore. Row that boat ashore. And they're, and they're focusing on that. So when their eyes looked up and they saw the Lord walking on water, they were freaked out, man. They're like, we saw a ghost. Because they were distracted, but then Peter was like, Lord, if that's you. And he's like, come to me. And meets him right in the middle. The Lord's not interested in raising a bunch of spiritual sissies. Amen. That's how I wrote it. I got to read what I write sometimes. Always whining and asking Father to deliver them from their problems. He's raising up soldiers who know their Father's heart and will under the guidance of the king and empowered by the spirit. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Men and women who have been trained, molded, and shaped by everything in life and are overcomers in this world like their master. This world, in my opinion, is a place of training. Before I knew Christ, before I had that 55 degree water baptism and became born again, this world was all I knew. Everything about this world was my glory. It was my heaven. It was my end, end all. 
But then when I got born again and Christ came in, my eyes were illuminated and this world was put into perspective. And I realized that there's so much more than what I see and feel around me. But then what I saw and felt around me was warring against me. Isn't that what the scriptures teach us? Every day that stuff wars against you, against your members, and your own members war against you because now you're a spiritual creature, but yet you got this body of bones that you got to carry around, and it desires things, and it wants things, and it, it literally is part of this natural world. And so naturally, it desires the things of the world. But Christ illuminated you in your heart, and now your heart longs for the things which are on high, the things of the kingdom. And then we find ourselves stumbling, we find ourselves falling, and it's okay. I'm not saying that Christ isn't there to help you. Because when Peter doubted and he fell into the water, it says Christ reached right out and pulled him up, stepped him into the boat, and then ceased the winds. He said, oh, you have little faith. He is there to help us, but that wasn't what his initial purpose was for Peter. His initial plan was to teach Peter that, yes, you can do this. Yes, you can meet me right here. Let your faith be exercised and know that you are an overcomer just as I am an overcomer because you are in me and I am in you. And if you ask, I will give you anything according to my will. We can water walk to those that are willing to believe. Jesus said all things are possible. You say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast to the sea. We are in a training ground, a school, if you will, in the spirit. Before you were born again, I already said that, this world is, is everything. But God is using it now to train you spiritually. I think that's pretty cool. All of your trials, all of your struggles, everything that you experience here that normally would shipwreck you, for lack of better words, literally, Jesus is saying... We're going to allow this to mold you and shape you and train you, if we allow. We can get bitter, not better, right? Mm -hmm. We can be the, the person who complains about everything around us, everything in this, 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 this warring that's warring against us. We could start majoring on that and start focusing on that and, then, and just become so uh, bitter about it that we don't grow at all. Or we can look for Christ in the middle of it all. And see what it is that he's tra training us. What is it that you're teaching us, Lord? And begin to praise him even in the middle of the chaos. Begin to praise him even in the middle of your storm. And he'll see you through. Every new trial is just an opportunity for growth. If we hit it head on with faith. And... I just have a few notes written, but they're nothing major. But I was thinking about the storms. You know, a lot of times when we preach and we talk about storms, we always think of chaos. And I said this last night, I always think of the bad things. But that doesn't necessarily mean bad things. Storms could mean just busyness. You know, you've got ministry going on. You've got your life. You've, you've got grandchildren, children. You've got work. You've got all this stuff going on. And it can get kind of chaotic. And Jesus wants to meet us in the middle of everything we have going on. He wants to be the focal point of what we have going on. He wants to be the boat that you're sailing in. I was in doing uh, work release back in San Diego years and years and years ago. I was going out on trucks. We all wore the same green clothing. We went on these green trucks and we went to parks and we dug ditches and cleaned up. In other words, I was in jail. <laughs> <laughs> I was in jail, okay, and I would, but I got to go to this place, uh, Camp West Fork, which was a probation camp. And what was really cool about the probation camp was one, it didn't have fences. So you were there on your own trust. You could walk away. You were five miles from the nearest road, but when you did walk away, and people did, you'll be labeled and you'll be a uh, high risk next time you go to jail, so you don't want to do that. But the cool thing was is they fed you better food, they fed you more food, and you got to go out and you got to work, so your time went faster. I had a five-month sentence to do. Uh, bunch of failures to appears and traffic stuff mainly and I remember being there and I was a smoker then and so we, we would work out deals to get cigarettes they let you smoke then too it was they don't do it anymore but they, they let you then and I was this one guy and we were having a cigarette and he was a big AA guy and he was, had this real calmness about him like this real peace and nobody likes to preach no one wants to listen to a preacher in jail because we're all there right <laughs> like I don't want to listen to you you're here too but this guy was really preaching the AA thing. And I said to him, I said, you know, I had just gotten born again recently and I was on fire. I, just, I was really coming to life. And it was all new to me. But I knew a few things. I knew Christ. And that's what mattered. And I said to him, I said, what, what is your higher power? 
Oh, well, my higher power is my boat. This is what he tells me. My boat. I love to get out on the water and just set sail. I mean, he said it with such, the words, it's such elegance, you know. just love to get out on the water and just set the peace and set sail. And I, I'm standing there, and I was new. You know, I'm new. And I had no filters, and I looked at him, and I said, what happens if your boat sinks? You know? <laughs> and he was like, he didn't have anything for that. I guess he would have to look for a new higher power. I can't have a higher power that is powerless, personally. My boat is Christ. Amen. My boat is master of this world. My boat is the overcomer of everything in this world. My boat is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. My boat is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Mine conquered death and hell and the grave, and he holds the keys now. And he's telling us that if we would believe in him and that we would accept him and that we would live after him, that we too could be overcomers like he's an overcomer. Amen. And we are little overcomers in training. And we are on a way. It's not universalism. There's not many ways that lead to heaven. There's one way, and it's Christ. And we need to get that in our hearts that we would not be distracted by our means of transportation or not allow our boat, which is being tossed to and fro by all the winds and the waves, to distract us, but that we would focus on Christ, who is our foundation. He is our source. He is our Lord. Not allow the things in this world to get us off course. But just remember this, that Jesus and God is not trying to, to just raise up those sissies, like I said. He's not trying to just answer your prayer requests for all of your heartache and pain and, and things that are worn against you. He wants to use that to develop you. This world is a training ground. He's raising up mature believers. One day we're going to get to heaven and or heaven and earth are going to become one, however it all pans out in the end. I know if you're pre, post, trib, past, trib, you know, rapture, I don't know, you know, we don't need to get into all that today. But one day, we're going to meet Christ, and we're going to be together, and we're going to shed this earth suit, and we're going to take on a glorified body, and we're going to be one with him. And heaven and earth will be new, and they'll be one. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but you know what? We've got to get this stuff right now. Because Jesus is telling us that we need to overcome this stuff. Because we're coming into a place where this stuff is not even going to matter. That's funny, matter. Matter won't matter. Closing thought. Our Lord walked on water. But so did Peter. And he was a man. Another thing that blows my mind is when Jesus resurrected. He took his body, right? Out of the tomb. He took his physical body. Remember, it wasn't there. But he could appear and disappear with his physical body. Does that, that defies all logic, doesn't it? And it says all the apostles were in a room one day, and the door, it, it purposely says the door was shut. And then Jesus came and stood among them. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> with his body, which means he walks through walls now. Here, come. Thomas, come. Touch the holes in my hand. What is overcomers? I mean, we whine and complain about little trials and heartaches. And My boss was mean to me today. And Jesus is saying, I want to teach you how to walk through a wall. <laughs> and we got to learn to overcome the small things. The things that most of us deal with on day in and day out are, are just heart issues and mind, mind thoughts and things that, you know, daily life. And he's calling us to walk on water. Greater things you will do. I, I, hey, I'm not walking on water through walls yet. It would be really convenient, though, when we buy these buildings and we need to go from building to building. We don't have to go out and around. We can just be like, I'm going to go check on the kids. I'll be right back. Oof, I'm in there. <laughs> don't worry, he's coming back. Every new believer here would run out. This is definitely a cult. They're walking through walls. With witchcraft. <laughs> yeah. Let's close with one verse. Psalm 23. Psalm 23. We'll get you out of here in time for, I don't know, whatever it is you're going to do. Food. Tacos next week. <laughs> Food. 
Last night I read this too, and, and you know, I, God took me to this yesterday, and I, it's, the, it's the chapter that they read at every funeral. Ever, everyone that's dying, everyone that's dead. They read this over, right? <laughs> I mean, this is like Psalm 23. It must be, it's a comforting chapter. It brings comfort, I guess, to those around the dead person. But let's read this. Read this in a new light. I mean, this, this was written by David, right? Yeah, Psalm of David. And he was re- writing this and declaring this while he was alive. <laughs> wow. So he wasn't declaring this over at a funeral. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the literal translation is, I shall not lack. He makes me to lie down in green pastures or pastures of tender grass. He leaves me beside the still waters, and mine says waters of rest. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's a whole preaching right there. That speaks of God's correction and leading us and helping us. You prepare a table. This is like the point. This is the reason I went to this verse. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I'm getting more peaceful just reading this. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of my Lord forever. Hallelujah. The Lord prepares a table in the midst of your enemies. How powerful is that? You know, we read about Peter meeting Jesus in the, in the storm, and I didn't even get into Shadrach. I think mean, next week maybe we'll look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were tossed into a fire for their faith. And Jesus met them in the fire. He didn't stop them from being thrown in. He didn't, like, deliver them while, quickly before they got burned. He said, check it out. I'm going to meet you in your fiery trial. And I'm going to stand with you, and we're just going to hang out here and not get fried. That's powerful. Peter stood in the midst of a storm and met Christ. He met him right in the middle of the storm that he was in. And Jesus goes on, David goes on to tell us that you prepare a table for me to eat dinner basically with you in the midst of our enemies. There's a think of a battle going on, whatever movie you've ever seen, and, and, and there are you know, shields and, and spears, and I'm, I'm going back a few hundred years. It's not machine guns. This is a few hundred years. Whatever battle you want. But in the middle of that, you're sitting down with Jesus to have Amen. tacos. Because <laughs> that's what I'd be having. This is mine. This, you make your own. This is mine. <laughs> I'm sitting down to have tacos. There's a comfort there. What, what David was really trying to show us, there's a peace that comes with that. There's a peace in your knowledge of who Jesus really is. Remember the devotion we read in the beginning? We can't be obsessed with the service that we do unto the Lord. We need to be devoted to serving the Lord. All that service and people getting saved and all of that good stuff happens naturally by us being devoted unto Him. And when we're truly devoted unto Him and we're serving Christ, that's when you find yourself having dinner in the middle of all the chaos. That's when you find a table in the middle of a war sitting prepared for you because you're meeting Christ in the middle of it all because you're serving and you're devoted to him. Does that make sense? If you're running around doing tabernacle stuff and doing church stuff and doing little Camilla's going to be coming and we're focusing on all of the crazy life that we have and we forget to be devoted to Christ, our war that we're in will consume us. But when we're grounded and rooted and knowing why we're doing it and who we love and who we serve and who we adore, we find peace in the middle of it all. And my wife always says, she told the Lord that her peas and carrots were running off her plate. So the Lord said, I'm going to give you a bigger plate. (laughs) Yeah. You can't have a bigger plate either without having that devotion, without having that peace. But man, if if you can center yourself in that, God knows how big your plate could get, you know. You can handle it. So be blessed. Be centered. We know who who our salvation is. 
Father, we thank you and we praise you. Father, help us to be reminded continually, Lord, that you are our rock. You, Lord Jesus, are our all in all. You're our safe place, Lord. You're our high tower, our stronghold. You are that table, Lord, that's prepared in the midst of our battle. Lord Jesus, help us to be so devoted and so consumed, Lord, and in love with you that we would not be shipwrecked by the everyday. But Lord, that people would stare at us and they would look upon us and say, how do you do it? And we'd be able to say, come, sit, have dinner. Lord, help us to know in the busyness, God, that we can have peace. But help us, God, to stay focused, focused. And we praise you, God, and we give you the glory. And we thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. You never leave us, nor do you forsake us. And you're continually building us and strengthening us to be examples of you. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Don't forget to...